Hollywood, California, movie-making capital. Films created here impact people all over the world. But when a film influences the criminal mind, the result can be devastating. In what we're calling the Scream murder case, Should filmmakers be held responsible for copycat crimes? Why are filmmakers any more responsible? We just made the movie. We don't sell them the guns. But society has already suffered at the hands of copycat criminals. Whatever I've seen on the movie is what I imitated. It's a debate that has raged since the dawning of the motion picture industry. Does violence shown at the movies cause real-life violence? For some, there is ample evidence that many killers mimic on-screen murders. But is this the fault of the filmmakers, or is there something predisposed in the minds of those who commit these deadly crimes? In this edition of Investigative Reports, some cases in point. As the film industry seems to be pushing the violence envelope further and further, but as we'll hear from those in Hollywood, they're being unfairly blamed for the ills that plague society today. Each year, over a billion people in the United States go to the movies. For most, the two-hour escape ends when the lights come up. But for some, the line between reality and fiction is unclear. In Linwood, California, that line blurred for three local teens whose obsession with the hit film series Scream turned deadly. According to the police reports, Mario Padilla and his two accomplices studied the films and created a plan to reenact each of the fictitious murders on friends, family, and classmates. Scream murder case has several counts, conspiracy to commit several more murders against other people other than family members in a, um, a fashion copycatting the Scream movies. Every detail of the murders was meticulously plotted to correspond with the killings in the two films. The first attack on Mario's mother, Gina Lenore Castillo, would allow access to the money she was saving for her new daughter. Money the boys were planning to use to purchase a mask and voice box like the ones used in the Scream movies. The boys attacked Gina in her home on January 13th, 1998. Gina Castillo died upon arrival at a local hospital. The boys were apprehended immediately following the attack. The incident in Linwood wasn't the only scream-related copycat crime. There have been others, including a stabbing at a Philadelphia area theater during a screening of Scream 2. While Lakeisha Jones and a friend were watching the film, a teenage girl attacked them with a knife. The incident occurred within weeks of the murder of Gina Castillo. Another hit horror series also came under scrutiny when the film Child's Play 3 was mentioned in the case of two-year-old Jamie Bolger, who was abducted from a British shopping mall. Jamie was tortured and murdered by two youngsters in a fashion resembling violent acts in the movie. Tyler, come out, come out, wherever you are. Ollie, Ollie, oxen free. 
Get out here, you little son of a uh, Child's Play 3 was a uh, rather grisly horror film, American produced, and the notorious killing of James Bulger, a two-year-old child in Liverpool, England, by a couple of preteen kids, very closely followed some of the abusive behaviour that was in Child's Play 3. But a film need not fall under the horror category to be included as an influence in copycat crimes. In fact, the reported incidents of horror film copycats are surprisingly few. People talk about horror films as, as you know, having a negative impact and, and, and making, uh, turning kids on to violence. I think what some people tend not to notice is that horror films, by definition, are the only genre of film that encourage a negative reaction to the violence that they depict. The list of films that have been blamed for inciting copycats is as varied as the products Hollywood releases each year. From the cult classic A Clockwork Orange, to the classic love story Romeo and Juliet. In 1997, it was a teen drama that was said to have inspired mayhem. West Paducah, Kentucky. In the first week of December 1997, this riverside town on the Kentucky-Illinois border became the scene of blood and terror when 14-year-old Michael Carneal opened fire on an unsuspecting group of students as they gathered at his school for a morning prayer meeting. When questioned, Carneal talked about a scene from the film Basketball Diaries as one of the inspirations behind his crime. Corneal arrived at school on the morning of December 1st with five stolen guns and proceeded to spray bullets at a gathering of students, killing three and wounding several others. This incident was among the first in the recent wave of school shootings that have taken place in small town high schools across the United States, from Pearl, Mississippi to Springfield, Oregon. Each generation has been exposed to more and more media. So in a sense, each new generation is more vulnerable to the psychological impact of media and to engaging in copycat crime. Though film-related copycat crimes seem to be just a few isolated incidents, in fact, the phenomenon appears to be on the rise. Just since the incident involving the abduction and murder of Jamie Bulger in 1993, there have been dozens of reported film-related copycat crimes in the United States alone. The incidents uh, that we now hear about have increased, I would say, at least tenfold in the past ten years. By the time the average child reaches adulthood, he or she will have witnessed some 40,000 murders and 200,000 other violent acts in movie theaters and at home on television. Scary statistics that some leading media experts feel have played a role in creating a generation of angry, aggressive children. There are a lot of kids that are angrier than they were 10 or 15 years ago. Stress of the family, a lot more broken homes, kids that don't know any other reaction when they're frustrated than to strike out in a violent way. They're, they don't have anything else in their arsenal of responses. You add that to the, these violent images, it will grow and fester to the point where you may have a full-blown fantasy mixed in with violence, and we see the, res the tragic results. The three victims in Paducah were killed by a teen who used a movie as a guide. The same motive was echoed in comments made by Mario Padilla after his arrest, and can be found in many testimonies of convicted copycat criminals. When serial rapist and murderer Nathaniel White confessed to authorities in New York State, for example, he clearly indicated his desire to follow the actions of his criminal mentor, Kane, from the film series RoboCop. I've seen him um, cut somebody's throat and then take the knife and slit him down the chest and the stomach. And I look at a violent movie and... Um, Whatever I've seen on the movie is what I imitated. Life imitating art recently led to an international investigation when two young Belgians accused of the murders of their respective spouses 
moved from Brussels to South Miami Beach. Peter Schmidt and Aurora Martin met in 1991 at a rock climbing gym in Belgium. There was an instant attraction and the two started to date. Soon they discovered they both had an interest in the criminal lifestyle. They discussed becoming modern day pirates, taking pleasure boats by storm and killing everyone on board. But that idea was dropped in favor of a simpler plan. They'd hide their relationship, find two lonely singles, romance and marry them, then murder them for the insurance payoffs. Their plan and their relationship bore a striking resemblance to the life and actions of the murderous couple in the cult classic The Honeymoon Killers, a connection indicated in a Time magazine article about Martin and Schmidt. At the beginning of 1992, after a few months of searching, Peter found a 22-year-old woman named Ursula Duchat, who agreed to marry him. Shortly thereafter, their car plunged off a cliff and into a river. Peter emerged unharmed. Ursula, a champion swimmer, was dead. Because she wasn't bruised, and the cause of death was ruled to be drowning, there was initial suspicion of foul play. But her death was ruled an accident, and Peter collected almost half a million dollars in life insurance, and together with Aurora, moved to Miami, Florida. The money allowed Peter and Aurora to purchase boats, sports cars, oceanfront property, and to enjoy the world-famous nightlife in South Beach and Coconut Grove. But they were in their early 20s and careless with money. When the cash supply was running low, they became desperate. Like the protagonists in the film The Honeymoon Killers, they turned to murder to regain their fortune. It was now Aurora's turn to find their next victim. Peter Schmidt and Aurora Martin arrived back in Belgium in early 1995. Martin registered with a matrimonial agency and was soon introduced to an accountant named Mark Van Beers. By early May, they were married. According to Aurora, on May 11th, while they were honeymooning in Corsica, Van Beers' car swerved to avoid an object in the road and plunged off a cliff. Martin was unharmed. Van Beers was dead. But police reports suggested a different scenario, one in which Martin enticed Van Beers to a desolate mountainside where he was attacked by Schmidt and two accomplices. They put him back in his Nissan and pushed the car over a cliff. But suspicion was mounting as evidence was piling up against Martin and Schmidt. They fled Belgium and returned to Miami where they resumed their extravagant lifestyle, now living off Van Beer's insurance payoff. This time they received close to $800,000, but even this was not enough. Late into 1997, as they began searching for their next victim, this time through a Miami dating service, they saw an article about themselves in a magazine called The Paris Match, where they were referred to as the diabolical lovers. They had to act fast. With their next victim, they were going to use the money to create false identities and go into permanent hiding. It was at this time that a tip from Aurora's stepmother to the Belgian authorities led to their arrest. They were arrested in mid-November. From the information that we had, they were aware that they were uh, being sought for the murders in Belgium, uh, and they had gone into hiding. I, I believe there's an article in the Paris Match uh, sometime in, in July or early August that they were aware of, and, and that prompted them to go into hiding. It was a, a sort of a surreal kind of thing that, that came out of the movies when we first heard about the case. The Honeymoon Killers, that type of storyline, it's, it's hard to believe that, that people could do that. But people have been committing film-related copycat crimes since the earliest days of cinema. In 1903, it was Edwin Porter's great train robbery that was blamed for a string of train teller holdups. Since then, film-related copycat crimes can be identified with almost every trend feature films have gone through. 
Gangster films of the 20s coincided with a rise in organized gang activities. The westerns of the 50s brought an increase in bank holdups. In the 70s, a genre called black exploitation films was accused of providing a handbook on how to commit a crime. Ex-criminals like Lester Brown, now a successful businessman, once faced 250 years in prison for crimes he himself says were inspired by films. Most influential to Lester was the classic film Superfly. you a gun and all those black folks you keep doing so much talking about get guns and come back ready to go down and I'll be right down front killing Whitey until you can do that you go sing your marching song someplace else I'll be through talking when this movie Superfly came out, like before, all of a sudden, that in my mind was what I was searching for. And I would, before I would commit a crime, I would ask myself, oh, you know, how would they do it? How, how would a real gangster do this? And I would figure it out in my mind. I would visualize that person, the way that person would do it, and then I would go out and do it. As the film industry progressed towards more equal roles in mainstream films for minorities, the popularity of black exploitation films diminished. But almost as a reaction to the diversifying of films, another trend began to develop in Hollywood, the loner picture. A classic of this genre is the film Taxi Driver. Taxi Driver was the film indicated by gunman John Hinckley as one of the inspirations behind his 1982 assassination attempt on Ronald Reagan. It was completely clear that the movie Taxi Driver was a large part of the thought process that led to those shootings. There was actually a time while the movie Taxi Driver was being played for, uh, for the jury at the John Hinckley trial, during which, of course, we were all watching Hinckley see how he was reacting to the movie and at one point he sort of buried his head in his hands but I think it probably was a genuine emotional reaction on his part because he was, remained obsessed with taxi driver for a long time after his trial when a jury found Hinckley guilty by reason of insanity he was committed to St. Elizabeth's mental institution where he remains today though the 80s saw a continued copycat incidents the media frenzy surrounding the phenomenon didn't heat up again until after the release of Oliver Stone's Natural Born Killers in 1994. The film Stone describes as a comment on the way our society has become desensitized to violence. To date, there have been over a half dozen reported NBK copycats, including a school shooting, where the perpetrator, 14-year-old Barry Lucatus, said his actions were inspired by NBK's Mickey and Mallory Knox. Lucatus' shooting spree in Moses Lake, a small town in Washington state, left three classmates dead and another seriously injured. In one of the more infamous cases, teenagers Sarah Edmondson and her boyfriend, Ben Darris, took their obsession with natural-born killers Mickey and Mallory too far. The teens embarked on a murderous rampage, leaving one dead and a store clerk permanently injured from a gun wound. The incidents now known as the NBK killings are currently at the focal point of a lawsuit pending against Oliver Stone for the film's role in the crimes. Aside from the suit, the film has been widely criticized for its glamorization of violence and its potential effect on some of its viewers, like 19-year-old Nathan Martinez. In round glasses and a shaven head, Martinez and a friend blasted the film's soundtrack as they headed across the Utah state line. After murdering his stepmother and sister, he had seen natural-born killers over 20 times. In the early morning hours of December 13, 1996, James Halverson was gunned down as he jogged around a track in the quiet Long Island suburb of Center Reach. The gunman, 21-year-old William Sodders, was turned in by his own father, 
who told authorities of his son's obsession with the movie Natural Born Killers. He uh, was very anxious to use this weapon. Uh, he, he had a keen interest in wanting to use it. He wanted to use it to kill someone. You take a youngster who has that predisposition. You put them in an environment where the media shows these things. It's like a triggering effect. It doesn't create, but it triggers. A trigger, or the part of the film that a criminal is influenced by, is at the heart of the problem of stopping the phenomenon of copycats. Clearly, one of the problems with this double-edged sword that is cinema is that on the one hand, it's a wonderfully communicative medium, magnificently beautiful in its imagery when it's well shot. And on the other, it has this capacity to break down the walls between realism and fantasy. And that's both its tantalizing power and also its talent to abuse. I think that part of the movie industry is bad is when we kind of glamorize. If we glamorize the, uh, the bad guys, we always say sometimes the dragon wins. And if we, we show that uh, done in such a way that it's a kind of a glamorous thing, of course, there'll be someone who's unstable, mentally imbalanced, who, who may be, uh, you know, affected, uh, you know, by that. In Aberdeen, Washington, a Pacific Northwest lumber town, just such a person made headlines recently. A local entrepreneur named Virginia Kay hatched a plot to commit a series of bank robberies based on the film, Set It Off. Everybody get down on the ground right now! Put your hands up, move back! Everybody stay down! Oh, stay down! Virginia Kay was well known among Aberdeen's youth. She owned an underage nightclub and invited homeless teenagers to live with her. She provided shelter, but exacted a price. She recruited four of her tenants to help her pull off a bank robbery. The film Set It Off provided Virginia with a blueprint for the crime. In this room, they watched a movie several times, with each girl imitating a different character from the film. After several rehearsals, Virginia felt they were ready to commit the crime. The girls would go to neighboring Olympia, the state capital of Washington. A bank would be chosen, and they would execute the plan. They followed the bank robbery part of the movie pretty much just like the movie uh, was. They even counted off in seconds and uh, had the same number of girls and, and followed pretty much the, the scene of the bank robbery in the movie. The girls returned to Aberdeen but were apprehended quickly. A tip from one of their boyfriends led to their capture and the arrest of Virginia Kay. The set it off incident hasn't been the only copycat in Aberdeen. Two youths inspired by the movie The Crow tried to burn the town down to the ground. This area over here that you see is replanted with flowers and stuff is the area where the public uh, restroom and public parks building stood. Uh, the kids set it on fire and burned it to the ground. From watching the movie The Crow, they thought that that was very exciting and enjoyed the violence in the movie, and that wanted them to recreate that mayhem that they saw in the movie. The similarity of a movie scene to a real-life crime scene may seem familiar when a detective notices the copycat aspect. When I look at and consider it copycat, I'm really looking at beyond modus operandi. I'm looking at the, the signature, and that is something that that victim is, uh, something's being done to that victim that is very, very unique in the uh, in the crime, and uh, which he may he, he may be influenced by by uh, media. Uh, that that signature. In the summer of 1995, police investigators said they felt they were walking onto a movie set during their investigation into a subway bombing allegedly influenced by the hit film, Money Train. I'm not in it for the money. In the real-life Money Train incident, subway clerk Harry Kaufman lost his life. Unfortunately, this incident hasn't been the only Money Train copycat. The three men suspected to have been involved with the murder of Harry Kaufman with a second set of criminals to try and copy the subway bombing from the film. Legendary FBI profiler John Douglas 
believes these criminals all share personality traits common to copycats. We have 270 million people, of all different kinds, of, they come in all types of shapes and sizes and intellectual levels. You see the movie Money Train, and then you set fire uh, to, uh, um, to the booth where, the, where this person was working, we were selling his, his tokens. Now, these are not bright. These are punks. These, these are, are a couple of punks that saw this, this movie. They're, they're below average in intelligence. They're, they're street thugs. So, so, yeah, they're, they're influenced, but they're bad anyway. If it wasn't that, they would have committed you know, some other crime. The reality of the money train incidents is that the film was the trigger for these criminals, which helps raise the issue of responsible filmmaking as a possible solution to the copycat phenomenon an issue filmmaker John McNaughton faced after the release of his film, Henry, Portrait of a Serial Killer. I got put on the spot in Canada by this woman one time, and it was just like a day of like 14 hours of interviews, and it was late in the day, and I was being shuffled around, and my head was spinning, and she sort of ambushed me. And it's, of course, you know, you always think, you know, two hours after the interview, I should have said this. And what I should have said was, if you could find any instances of someone committing a crime and saying it's because they watched my picture. Because what we indeed tried to do in that picture, and Henry, was to show violence for fun, and then a little bit later show how absolutely awful what they really and hideous it is to, to actually commit a crime. A pattern. What they call them. There's people that always want to censor, always want to limit what you can show, all, you know, whether it be in literature, whether it be in film, whether it be in art exhibits with Maplethorpe or whatever, there's always going to be the cry for censorship. This is, you know, the, the purpose, the job of the artist in one sense is to push the boundaries. And the job of the conservative, you know, reactionary forces is to say you've gone too far. Just what is too far? McNaughton's film received an X rating for violence, but to date, there has not been a single reported copycat incident in relation to the film. Henry, however, is still criticized for its potential effects on its audience. Julia Phillips, producer of Taxi Driver, believes the criticism is misguided. Maybe society is having a negative in influence on film. Well, you know, it's a bottom line business. Give the people what they want. Maybe it's what the audience wants, you know. To me, it's the audience more to blame than the filmmaker for gobbling this stuff up. Despite the influence behind the creation of a film, the effects movies have on some of their viewing audience is undeniable, which helps strengthen the idea of censoring films. But in a world where even so-called family films have inspired violent copycat behavior, where would censorship begin and where would it end? The film industry has been self-censoring since the early days of cinema. Under a rule book called the Hayes Code, there were dozens of do's and don'ts. The code limited on-screen violence, warned against detailing criminal methods, and stressed the importance of not encouraging sympathy or glamorizing the criminal. Surprisingly, the person who changed the code was a man who has been targeted as a censor himself. In 1967, current Motion Picture Association President Jack Valenti trashed the code in favor of a more liberal rating system. I came up with the idea of classifying movies, not whether they're good or not, not whether they have quality or lack of it, but what is on the screen that parents, parents might find objectionable for their younger children to watch. So we gave them warnings. The rating system created by the MPAA is still in place today and does have an effect on box office sales. Many filmmakers consider this when making decisions about graphic and questionable scenes. But the process of filmmaking is long and difficult. And oftentimes, a scene is not ready to be judged until it's in its final stages, which can make self-censoring difficult. When we shot Henry, there were certain scenes, uh, for instance, the big fat guy that got the TV over the head. When you're shooting that, it's the funniest thing in the world. You have technicians with, with uh, syringes, with tubes running with fake blood, you know, hiding behind, you know, out of camera range, and they're like, action, and they're squirting this blood, and squirting everywhere. And, you, you know, it's all you can do to not ruin the take by bursting out into laughter. But then you go into the theater, and, you, you know, now, you, you know you're the illusion of the motion picture. You're creating an illusion of, of a world and really being there. And you see people start running out the doors. It's not at all funny. 
Many directors share McNaughton's concern for their audience, including Jonathan Demme, who hired John Douglas as an FBI consultant on his film, Silence of the Lambs. When he made the movie, and I, I watched him when he was editing out, he could have made it very, very gory, uh, and uh, what he was doing was, was really attempting to, kind of like Alfred Hitchcock, leave it as best as he could the imagination of, uh, of the, the viewer. Despite Demi's efforts with Silence of the Lambs, one of the film's villains, Hannibal Lecter, was mentioned recently in a court proceeding by a serial rapist and murderer as one of his influences. And of course, I got a big, big spread in the, uh, in the newspapers uh, that this person you know, had seen this movie, had an effect on and was influenced by the movie when he killed this woman. He certainly saw the, the movie, but I can't really... You know, Put it on the res it was the responsibility or the fault of uh, Jonathan Demme or the or the, uh, the the movie Silence of the Lambs that caused this person to perpetrate you know, that uh, crime. John Douglas's impression of director Jonathan Demme echoes a sentiment many filmmakers feel about the phenomenon of film-related copycats: that their intentions with a film can differ greatly from some audiences' reaction to their work. You talking to me? We felt we were making a movie that was um, iconographic for its time. Um, unfortunately, that time doesn't seem to have ended. Um, you know, portrait of the lonely psycho as um, influencer of world events. I mean, basically, Taxi Driver is about loneliness. We certainly didn't make the movie to encourage people to assassinate other people. I mean, there is a subcore of psychos in America whom, unfortunately, we've chosen to allow to be armed. We just made the movie. We don't sell them the guns. So, I, you know, why are filmmakers any more responsible? It's kind of a scapegoat in a sense that, you know, if someone wants to, if, if someone wants to, if someone wants to come up with an easy way out for what they've done, if someone doesn't want to take responsibility or doesn't want to address the fact that they've committed an act of violence, it's easy to say, oh, well, I saw a film. That made me do it. That's, that's the easy explanation. Blaming a film in the courtroom is an avenue that some attorneys use to try and persuade a jury to pass a more lenient judgment against their client. But it's usually a weak defense if the connection to the crime is not clear. In general, uh, I think juries uh, are not going to let people off the hook, so to speak, uh, by them saying, I am not responsible for my actions because I am weak and I did what a character in a movie or a TV show did. But sometimes a film's influence on a criminal can go deeper than just reenacting a scene. The effect the movie Scarface has had on certain criminals is a clear example of this. Distribution. New York, Chicago, L.A. We gotta set our own mark. And what it. my colleagues and I noticed, what virtually everyone in the criminal justice community noticed, was after the movie Scarface was shown, there were a lot of people that started to dress, walk, and talk like the lead character. That became their lifestyle of incredible excess uh, which resulted in cocaine arrests, criminal conduct arising from it, and incidents of conduct that mirrored the movie. The biggest challenge in finding a solution to the problem of film-related copycat crimes is that there is no telling which films will have an influence. Let, let's not talk about right now. Let's talk about 1968, the movie Romeo and Juliet. It came out, several kids died, a bunch tried to, should we have pulled a movie because of that? Should the rest of the society suffer because of a deranged few? Should we all pay the penalty? We could then have to go through books, so we have to go through everything because of the fact is who has the freedom? And in a democracy, it's frightening. But we have to remember again, media doesn't create. It triggers those people that have the predisposition. There are 262 million people in the United States. There are over 23 million teenagers. You're always going to have young people out there whose minds are not balanced. 
the bubble is a little off center, almost anything could incite them. The question is, if you could prove to me that movie XYZ is going to lead to five murders that would not otherwise occur, it's a pretty good argument for cutting a scene or two out of movie XYZ. I think the reason, when you think it through, that many of us recoil from the idea of that censorship is that the cause and effect is very, very complicated. The bottom line is, we just don't know how many murders inspired by particular movies that would not have occurred otherwise. Even if there was a way to curb criminal copycat behavior by encouraging filmmakers in the future to take on a greater level of responsibility with their work, films already in distribution may continue to spawn copycats for years to come. During the summer of 1997, it was a 30-year-old classic that influenced a double homicide on the Oregon coast. Jesse McAllister and Bradley Price were popular with young people in Seaside, Oregon. The two lived together and shared a common love for movies. Brad even worked at a local video store so he could get an employee discount and benefits. Benefits like repeated rentals. Among the films he checked out a number of times was the classic true crime story, In Cold Blood. Why'd you pick me for this job? A perfect score needs perfect partners. Together, we're a perfect fit. It's your score. Where do I fit in? I got you figured for a natural born killer. Brad and Jesse watched the film several times before deciding to commit their own crime, a double thrill kill. In the early morning hours of July 14th, 1997, Jesse McAllister and Bradley Price approached Gabriella Goza and Frank Nims as they were cuddling in the sands off the Pacific Ocean in Seaside, Oregon. The boys walked up to them and with two shots murdered both Goza and Nims. Later that evening, the boys left Seaside and headed south towards Mexico, just like the killers in the film. I can't imagine anybody actually wanting to emulate the life of uh uh, of the two people in In Cold Blood, but there, there certainly are similarities. They killed more than one person for no apparent reason and fled to Mexico and returned to the United States. The senseless deaths of Gabriela Goza and Frank Nims Jr. have shaken the tiny town of Seaside and act as a reminder of the biggest challenge in solving the problem of film-related copycat crimes, that there is no telling what is going to trigger someone. So what is to be done about a future Brad Price or Jesse McAllister, a Barry Lucatus, or even a John Hinckley? Media psychologists suggest the answer lies in improving parents' approach to their children. It's a sentiment echoed in the walls of a penal facility 10 miles north of Seaside, designed to rehabilitate the type of youths who have acted out their influences. Here, Teens are incarcerated for up to 10 years for crimes such as rape, arson, theft, and murder. Among the issues they discuss are the effect films and other media have on their lives and the importance of positive role models. If you don't have a role model at home, you have to find a role model somewhere. And some people do look up to people who, actors or, you know, singers, people who have made it somewhere in their life. And I think that maybe a part of it is that they pick those people as role models and then they follow them. To these kids and to others at the facility, a positive role model could have helped them avoid trouble and shown them better ways to deal with the negative influences around them on the outside. The more that you are exposed to parents who are loving and affectionate and who spend a lot of time with you and attention, uh, the more you can fight against these images and ideas that you see on the screen. I've seen families come in uh, for years and years and years, wonderful families who have not really been assertive when they raise their children, and I've noticed that those type of families uh, have children who are more susceptible to being involved in matters like we're talking about. Another obstacle psychologists and the criminal justice community are facing in their efforts to stop the phenomenon of film-related copycats 
is the growing number of hours young people are exposed to media. Many experts believe the more violent acts children experience on the screen, the further they can remove themselves from the real consequences of a crime. The thing that most people don't understand is that acts of horrible violence take place in three seconds. And there's nothing romantic about homicide. Uh, there may be in the movies, but there isn't in real life. It's an incredibly grim, horrifying thing. In this movie I just saw, the way they had the blood and guts spurting, I'm going, whoa, I mean, this is really cool. I mean, it really is. Um, and. Real life isn't like that. Bodies, we don't usually see bodies blow up. And if they do, I mean, like in the plane crash that recently happened, nobody saw it that's alive. But this is a chance to see this kind of horrible violence. And if it is cool enough, um, you know, kids who are impressionable may really be affected by it. There's a lot of things that influence people out there. You know, if you're, if you're a greedy-minded person and you watch something like Dukes or boys in the hood where you want respect and greed, then that's what you're going to go out there and portray, and that's what you're going to go out there and try to achieve. Understanding the impact films and the rest of the media can have on a person is the first step towards curbing copycat behavior. Role modeling and early intervention are equally as important, but require an understanding of the common warning signs present in most copycat criminals. There are people that say that media creates violent kids. And, and think about that now. You're saying that a kid that come, doesn't come from a violent home, where conflicts are resolved in a peaceful way, you throw them, in, throw them in front of a video of Rambo and let them watch, they're going to go out and start shooting up neighborhoods? No. These are the people who are susceptible to uh, drug abuse, alcohol abuse. Uh, these are people who. Uh, uh, really need some early intervention in a meaningful way, one-on-one, -on -one, with people who care. If early intervention, positive role modeling, and monitoring the amount of time a person spends in front of a television or a movie screen are the actions that need to be taken, Dr. Butterworth believes there are some fundamental issues that need to be understood in order to control violent reactions to the images that are portrayed on the screen. First, we have to realize that there are a lot of youngsters nowadays that are having difficulty coping with frustration. And they need to be taught that when you get angry, you don't lash out. There are other ways you can talk it out. The schools may have to do it. The parents may have to get, it, get together to do it. But somebody has to do it. We have to identify these kids that have a potential for violence. Kids that, that are they're torturing animals, that may be fascinated with fire, that may be beating up little men being bullies. Film-related copycat crimes have already resulted in countless tragedies. But some are working hard to reverse this phenomenon. We can work with people, young people, and we can condition them to think differently. We can condition them, for instance, if, uh, that, if there's an influence on their lives, that's a negative influence. We can condition them how to use certain information where they can differentiate the difference between reality and fantasy. It doesn't have to be the way it is right now. Then there's the question of whether films can directly affect a jury's verdict. It may already have happened in Detroit. Several years ago, a white police officer was on trial for beating a black man to death. During a break in the deliberations, the jury was shown the film Malcolm X as entertainment. The film begins with graphic footage of Rodney King being beaten by police. The jury found the police officer guilty. The verdict, however, was later overturned by a higher court, which cited the film as a factor in the jury's decision. I'm Bill Curtis. Thanks for watching this edition of Investigative Reports here on A&E.